we are so honored to have the next speaker, Wilhelm Moltke, to join us today. Um, I described Caroline Lambert as the superstar of sustainable finance. If there's anybody who is the superstar of the actual investment and driving this in future, it's him. Willem has been the Secretary General of the Austrian People's Party, the Minister for Agriculture, the Vice Chancellor and Minister for Finance, and since 2005, he's been the Vice President of the European Investment Bank and the Managing Director of the European Fund for Strategic Investments. Thank you so much indeed for joining us today. The floor is yours. Well, good morning, everybody. It's indeed wonderful to be back to Vienna, uh, being Austrian, it's not a surprise. But more important, you have really chosen the hot potato and it's necessary to do so now. And I would put this a bit into a frame before going into the details what uh, this FC is currently doing. Yes, we have a clear target now by a commission's president-elect, and it's easy to spell and to tell it to be carbon neutral by 2050. This is a revolution. To be honest, I am not pretty sure that everybody knows what we are talking about. We talk about a revolution in achieving this, this target. Second, Ursula von der Leyen is proposing the Green Deal, and she is enormously ambitious in saying, I want to have the Green Deal in place in the first 100 days of my job. First 100 days, which means first quarter next year. And the deal, the Green Deal, is dealing with, for instance, closing the gaps in the emission trading system. Uh, the Green Deal is dealing with uh, uh, the carbon border tax. The Green Deal is dealing with the new industrial policy. The Green Deal is dealing with sector coupling. The Green Deal is dealing uh, yeah, with circular economy. You name it. It's really a comprehensive idea behind. And I find this extremely important. You cannot really tackle this challenge of being carbon neutral by select topic A or sector B. You have to be comprehensive. And to be comprehensive is also having a third component, which Ursula von der Leyen will propose, and I find this extremely important. You have to help sectors and regions they are not as advanced as others. It means the idea of having a transition fund to make this working and to make this happen is a crucial element. We shouldn't leave people behind or regions behind. Otherwise, we create a new political tension. And fourth, last but not least, she's proposing a European sustainable investment plan. And this has two components as, as far as I see it from now. First of all, she wants to change EIB, European Investment Bank, I come to this in a second, into a climate bank. And second, she wants to have a trillion euro investment incentivized for the next decade, she is saying, a trillion euro. That's the European Sustainable Investment Plan. One can say now, okay, a trillion Wow, it's something. But if you put this into perspective, you got a bit a slight different, a slight different view. The European Court of Auditors has made an assumption about the investment need from now to 2030, and their assumption is that the investment need to achieve the Paris targets and the sustainable targets is around 1.5. 1 trillion euro a year, a year. And if we look into that, I'm always surprised how precise Code of Auditors people are, can be, that the, the concrete figure is 1.157 trillion euros. It's interesting how they come to the seven, but that's okay. The vast majority of this money should go into mobility. Around 700 billion is, is targeted towards mobility. The second most important thing is buildings, and the third most important thing is industry. And there is one sector I'm missing, that's agriculture, which, by the way, has a relevance in both directions. That means 
if you put every in, maybe the one point some trillion is not really the truth, the full truth. But what does this mean? If you want to be successful, and we have to, it is the obligation, the obligation of our generation. We have to put the things into perspective and we have to join forces. Joining forces means, yes, there is a role of public sector and public finance also in the future. But the public sector and the public finance has limits. And to be honest, my very approach is, if we talk about the public sector, we shouldn't talk about money first. We should talk about proper regulation first. To incentivize investment, to have a proper planning capacity, to have sector coupling in place, to finance research, development, innovation, education. Those are things where the public sector has absolutely his obligations and duties. But the capacity of the public sector is limited. Overdebtedness is still a problem in the European Union. But in any case, public sector, yes. EU budget, we have heard a lot of things. EU budget is one instrument. And if you combine this with national budgets, with structural funds, you have a sum of money available. And then you have to think how to make the best out of it. I come back to this. Second, we need commercial banks. Even if it is a tricky situation for the commercial banks based on, 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 on the Basel rules and the, and, the, and the zero interest policy, we need the commercial banks for having, let's say, this transformatory capacity to attract private capital into these investment needs. Because without private capital, we cannot manage. And here, I think, what we had heard on taxonomy might help. Might help. There is a discussion ongoing. I find it interesting if it is in place, this taxonomy. Why couldn't be one idea to release the underlying capital of commercial banks if and when the investment goes into this direction to attract it? I'm absolutely, I'm deeply convinced we need the commercial bank. Third, we need structured project financing. You call it PPP. This is something that's not developed in all markets, and you need an advisory capacity to do, you need a legal capacity to structure this properly, you need a readiness from the public sector to share risk and revenues, and you need, let's say, a fundamental shift in attracting private investors into that, also by policymakers, because sometimes it is treated as a four-letter word in some regions. Austria is one of the countries where PPP is not totally well known, let's put it mildly. Fourth, we need the capital markets. I am so convinced that we have, on the one hand, a huge investment need, we know it, and on the other hand, we have an yeah, amount of money looking for let's say, investment for assets. Capital market is, is, is exactly the link we need. Capital market initiatives should cover from the very beginning means the, the startups, the venture capital, it should go into one of the gaps currently existing, the private equity for growing companies. It should go for infrastructure investment. It should go for energy investment funds, all things like that. And it, I find it a bit strange, to be honest, that institutional investors are looking for assets outside of the European Union, whereas we know investment inside of the European Union is a serious, a serious problem. And last but not least, I, I, I see a strong role for public banks, for public banks like the European Investment Bank. And this is not to replace others, it's simply to complement the picture. And what I hate, is the word either or. We need all of them. We need all of sources to make this, uh, investment, uh, this, mess, in, this investment happen. So I try to go now into, into my presentation. Yeah, here I am. Just a word on the European Investment Bank. The European Investment Bank is your bank. It's the bank of the current 28 member states. The European Investment Bank is, is founded in the Treaties of Rome in 58. 
That's the bank of the European Union, let's call it. We have uh, a balance sheet of roughly 580 billion, 80 billion euro. We are uh, twice of the size of the World Bank. We are the biggest multilateral financial institution that exists globally, but we are not totally well known, I would say. We are a hidden jewel of the European design. When Juncker was elected as president, at that time we had a serious economic crisis and his idea was, how can we tackle the troubles we have and we need a comprehensive plan that is based on three pillars. First and foremost, let's go for regulatory, a sound regulatory environment. That means the reforms on the EU level and on the national level. Second, let's go for increased capacity to advise how to design a project, how to structure a project, and how to implement the project. And the third pillar is, let's have a financial arm to attract and to incentivize additional investment, and this is the so-called European Fund for Strategic Investment. Uh, to be blunt, it's called a fund, it isn't a fund. It's not a single legal entity. What is, what is behind? Behind that is a guarantee, and the guarantee is uh, 33.5 billion, 26 out of the EU budget, 7.5 out of the reserves of the European Investment Bank. This guarantee is enabling EIB to take way more risk without endangering the AAA rating of the bank, and this is a key element for having access to cheap funding on the capital market. That's all about. And the whole idea is translate 30 billion guarantee into 100 billion financial products, call it guarantee, call it debt instrument, whatever, and these 100 billion should incentivize 500 billion investment over a period 2015 to 2020. And you can see here, the 500 is just achievable if you have 400 private capital in. That's the whole story, crowd in private capital. The regulation is, is simple and clear. The EIB is doing all the due diligence and the EIB products, EIB group products, including also the European Investment Fund, the subsidiary of EIB. And in parallel, we are deciding about the guarantee, whether a project is fit for having the privilege of being guaranteed. That's all about. An investor is never seeing us, and we are obliged to make a decision within 10 working days. That means there is no delay behind. It's really, it's really very efficient, a uh, very efficient tool. It's market-based tool. You see the sectors where uh, these uh, investments are foreseen. It's covering practically everything. But what is new? Since 2018, we had a clear climate target. At least 40% of our investments have to tackle climate, means mitigation and adaptation. There is a discussion ongoing now under InvestEU to increase this level of, 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 of ambition. I have already talked about the investment gaps. I skipped this. You see the impact on EIB balance sheet. If you compare 2012, the so-called special activities, this is exactly this category with higher risk. It was practically not existing in EIB activity. But now it has a serious share of annual activity in EIB. This Juncker plan was changing EIB totally from a rather, let's say, conservative institution to its way more risk-oriented, market-oriented new products and a fascinating, fascinating story. For instance, is under FC, three or four clients are new to the bank. It means it's possible to approach new, par new partners uh, mid-caps, for instance, they were not able for EIB to be financed. We have a, an ambition that was based also on agreement with other IFIs. We want to have 100 billion investment incentivized in climate action from 16 to 20. And here you see the priorities. And again, it's low carbon transport, it's renewable energy, and it is energy efficiency, which is also buildings, buildings and housing. These are our priorities 
where we wanna we wanna we wanna go to. We have seen the 500 billion figures. We are not talking about theory. We are talking about evidence. With the cutoff date in 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 in, in, in September, we have achieved 433 billion on approvals. That's not automatically signatures, and it's not automatically disp disbursement. But you see, we are well on track. And you see the priorities, we have roughly 30% of small, of small companies, also including climate activity. We have a high share of, of roughly a quarter that goes into RD&I, which I find extremely positive. We have an, uh, an energy, an energy uh, share about 20%, that's renewable energy and that is, that is energy grids. And what we have done just recently, for instance, we have invested uh, into the first real battery factory in Europe, Northwold, and their target is to play at least on level of Elon Musk, not to be dependent any longer from Asian or other sources. We are now preparing a next step, uh, a next step in a, in, a similar, in a similar size. What's catching up is digital, it's not a surprise. And I'm not an expert in this. But I do have the impression that digital is really the missing link if you go for sector coupling. You need digital for doing so. It's a tool, it's not science, it's a tool which we have to have in place. What is interesting, what you see here is, we have always been forced to, to, to showcase what's the impact of, of what we are doing here. And we are using the so-called the, the so Romolo model. This is a model designed by the Europe, European Commission, originally based for uh, designed for structural funds. It was now a bit adopted for, for financial instruments. You see the impact on jobs, short-term and long-term, and you see the impact on, uh, on the GDP structurally, long-term and short-term. And sooner than later, we will have a third component that's about climate. We have to have, of course, also let's say a clear, a clear information about the impact on climate, climate change, climate mitigation. This is something that will come by definition. I'm closing with one remark. FC is coming to an end by end of 2020. That means still one year to go. And FC will be replaced by InvestEU. InvestEU is following the very fundamental same principle. Currently, you have a guarantee of 38 billion out of the EU budget, and the, you have heard already, the target is to have 640 billion investment incentivized. That's not the final word spoken. I expect that this will be, let's say, at least the one trillion as a target for the next, for the next MFF. The fight in the European Parliament on budget will go on. There is a second big difference. Invest EU is not a monopoly for on a monopole for EAB any longer. EAB has 75% of the share and 25% is for other national promotional banks, which I find interesting because they know the market, they know the region. With one caveat, what are you doing in a region where a national promotional bank is not existing? And one of the challenges is you shouldn't be just ready to support or to, to have access for the big five. Is it KFW? Is it CDC? Is it CDP? What is about the smaller ones or those ones they, have, they do not have? it. And the third big difference is you have four policy windows. And I'm also saying that the last word is not spoken. Climate will be more important than originally, originally foreseen in the design. The four windows are SME innovation, infrastructure, and environment slash climate. But the design and the very principle is the same. Have a budget guarantee, leverages, leverage it, incentivize private capital, and achieve a way higher impact than using a single euro out of the budget just as a grant. That's it. Thank you.